Global Sports Marketing Strategies by Thomas St. John. Here's a picture of the NBA uh, opening game ceremony in 1994 in Japan. Uh, we'll talk briefly about the NBA, of how they were successful of, of separating their brand from the United States to the global, and also how FIFA was global as perspect of you know every country but United States and Austria, and we'll talk about how that flip-flopped. Um, We'll get into behaviors and, and exactly what they did structurally wise in a minute. But first off, I'm going to go over a couple uh, cool facts that I thought really drove the expansion of the NBA to make it a global destination that it is now. This game right here uh, was with the, the Portland Blazers and the Los Angeles Clippers. As you can see, the arena is full. Um, it's not the standard size arena that we might see a game in today in Japan. Probably 10 times larger, but to get that type of crowd in 1994, right after the Olympic Dream Team, um, is, is pretty amazing. Here's the NBA global map. Um, we had 92 international players on the open night rosters for this year, 2013. The NBA websites, there is about 14 websites throughout the United, uh, throughout the world. Uh, as you can see, we have Brazil, Italy, Istanbul, Turkey, India. The expansion is just amazing. The good thing about the NBA website is it's catered to their clients. It's catered to that country, to that language. It, the, if you click on the website, it's amazingly, it's done so well that it looks like there's an NBA in that city or in that country. The Facebook page, the NBA Facebook page, is also another great option for the NBA to explain globally. As you can see here, um, they kind of mirror the websites, but there's also expanded into countries that don't have the website. For example, South America with uh, Mexico. There's not a Mexican website, but there's a Facebook page for it. Awesome um, way to make it global there as well. Here's a very interesting fact page that I was able to chop up and put on here and show you. NBA was actually uh, the first game outside of the country. It was in 1978. 1978. That's 30, what, five years ago. The Washington Bullets played um, the Tel Aviv team in Israel and actually lost 98 to 97 in September of 1978. And if you look at today, we had uh, starting on October 5th, 2013, we had the Thunder playing in Turkey, Philadelphia 76ers playing in Spain, Oklahoma Thunder playing in England, Rockets playing in Philly, um, Philippines, the Bulls playing in Brazil, Rockets again in Taiwan, Golden State playing in two games in China with the Lakers, um, and then we had the Brooklyn Nets that just played the Atlanta Hawks in London. What's not on this list is the Mexican game that got canceled due to a generator fire. That would have been another game on here. But if we look from 1978 till now, they expanded this brand from not only China to Israel to Turkey to Spain to England. They're talking about actually putting possibly a team of 10 in England. Not one, not two, but 10. The reason why, when teams are traveling overseas, it makes it more, uh, more sense economical wise to play more than one game in England or London. They can play three or four of those teams over there and be associated with the NBA and vice versa they can have their teams come over it's only a six hour flight so that's almost like from New York to California it's not that hard to the logistics piece of it is not that hard it seems harder than it really is because of the time frame but it's really not that hard I believe uh, if anybody can do it the NBA will definitely do it David Stern is also looking head in to India to expand there another country with over 1 million people with a young population that loves basketball. Also, David Stern and Adam Silver are working with the, the Nets owner and the Russian government to further the growth sport over there and develop continent of, of Africa. Um, this is exactly what Adam Silver has said. When we do expand, we need to expand probably with multiple teams so that you wouldn't have an orphan team in Europe, but that you potentially have a division so the teams could play each other more often, and MDA teams presumably traveling in Europe could have more teams to play when they're over there, which makes complete sense. The NBA broadcasts in 215 countries and 41 languages. Uh, 55 million followers on social media just in China alone. And then lay scenes. This is where the NBA makes their money. They have over 200 worldwide, 60 of them are in Europe. This is very important to any company, especially a sporting company, um, to have a license spread throughout the country and throughout worldwide. This is 
definitely very important. That's it for the NBA right now. We'll talk a little bit more about the NBA in a second. Let's jump over to FIFA. Now, FIFA World Cup 2014 is coming in Brazil. That's going to be extravagant. Can't wait till that happens. I'm looking forward to see my Team Italy or Team USA, see how far they can advance. But why is football here in the United States? The USA was given the, world, uh, the winning bid for the 1994 FIFA World Cup. Part of that agreement was for the USA to host the World Cup was for the FIFA to expand its brand to the untapped market in the United States. So FIFA understood, look, we have every other country under lock, down, we need to get the United States on board. That's a very large company, just like what the NBA is doing. It's a very large company. Let's see what we can do. Let's get over there. Let's build the MLS. And this is how the Major League Soccer was introduced in 1993. And its first full season was in 1996. FIFA knew that in order to really explode that brand, that the United States had to be on board. And for the most part, it's taken a while. It's taken over 10 years for the USA to grasp, grasp soccer. But you got to figure, for example... If I had a, um, a four-year-old, five-year-old, in 1993 that wanted to play soccer, they're only maybe 21 now, and when they have their kid in a couple of years, that generation will teach their kids how to play. So we're probably about another 10 years away from having soccer, Major League Soccer, as a real top three sport in the United States. I see it could be football, basketball, uh, football, baseball, and then soccer. You know, it, it could be really possible. Another great reason why FIFA is expanded to the United States is the owners of the teams. Malcolm Glazer, the owner of the Tampa Bay Bucks, owns Manchester United, one of the largest uh, companies, or I'm sorry, sports teams in the world. Um, number one, valued, and it's in the uh, English Premier League. Another team is no longer owned by Tom Hicks is Liverpool, which is actually owned by Tom Warner, um, Tom Henry. I'm sorry of the Boston Red Sox, and also 1% of that is owned by LeBron James. So, they're trying to brand that, as you can see, basketball, LeBron James, now he's in football with Liverpool as a part owner. It's just going to make the the brand really big. Also, we see here is um, the New Jersey Nets, or Brooklyn Nets owner. He's a Russian, and he's the only um, basketball owner that is not actually... A United States citizen. He is a Russian citizen. So that's really huge for the for the game of basketball. As we can see here, these are the owner oh I'm sorry, these are the coaches of the teams. Um, what really stands out to me, we have Bobby Valentine. He was a USA, he's from US United States. He went over to Japan and actually won the series in Japan. Um, so he got the American name out there in Japan for baseball. Ulf Samuelsson, Sweden, uh, he's from Sweden. He's a USA coach, and he plays here in the United States. Uh, the opposite, you know, if we had to look at David Blatt, he's over in Moscow trying to build that brand for basketball, and it's working really well. The World Cup has 203 nations attempting to qualify for the 2014 World Cup. You know, the great thing about the World Cup is, here's a great quote, Poor countries beat rich countries. Gone over the United States team in 2010 World Cup. How true is that? You know, we look at a powerhouse like the United States. We think we have the best people, best sport actors, best people in the world that are ready to play. And then we we face a country that's you know has some economical challenges, and we lose to them in the in the 16th um, in the fourth round. So it's very it, it's it's all about sports. And how do how does FIFA and NBA do it? Here it is it's the basics. They have the brand, the promotion, sponsorship, licenses, the four P's: product, place, price, and promotion. This is how they drive the market. This is how they drive global recognition is through the brand itself. <clears throat> now this is how they do it. This is the, the the P's and Q's of how to get your team or how you get your league to be global. It's through intercultural management matters. Sports managers must come to understand and appreciate intercultural management, in part by reflecting on how their personal value system shapes their attitudes and behaviors. As the movement of people between countries become more fluid and the power of internet continues to blur operation boundaries for organizations, the appreciation of intercultural management becomes even more important in sports management. 
Intercultural management in sports affects multiple layers of organization, especially human resource practices, communication, financing, marketing, and um, communications again, to just name a few. This is where you would not want to be. Um, ethnical behavior is a person who evaluates people in a different race or culture by criteria that are specific to his own. This type of behavior can cause people to represent, resent their new colleagues' way of doing things, poor working conditions, and failed projects. Example, you go to Japan. You're introduced. They hand you a business card. Well, here in the United States, we take that business card, put it in our jacket pocket or shirt pocket. We look at it later, scan it into our computer, type it into our smartphone. Not in Japan. They take that very seriously. That's like... Um, their re representation of their self it's something that they built so if if you ever get a chance to do this and somebody hands you a business card you do it with two hands you grasp it in just like they would they would if you hand them a business card they put two hands out they put it in there they read it they stare at it they study it they make a, a great comment about how something may look on there or your position title it's very important that you cater to them The Garrett Hospital effect, uh, power distance, uncertainty, avoidance, individual collectivism, and masculine femininity. They've this is very important. The extent to which highly assertive masculine values predominate, for example, acquisition of money at expense of others, versus showing sensitivity and concerns for others, welfare and quality of life. That's very important in multicultural uh, compared to the United States, compared to London, England. Here's a, as you know, we go out there and. Sometimes the failings get involved, and that's where the femininity comes in place. Organization culture is a, <clears throat> a shared meaning of work or purposes in any organization is an important way in which people gain a sense of belonging, and this aspect should inform intercultural management practices. So there's three different levels. You have the visual signs, organization structure, organization process, level two, company strategies, company goals, company philosophies. Um, if espoused justification of existence, and then level three, unconscious, taken for granted belief, habits of perception, thoughts, and feelings. Culture shock. If you encounter problems in understanding the culture of the organization or the ways of doing things within another country, hire somebody who understands the local country. Great example, Tom Henry could have came into Liverpool and brought in all his baseball people or his own soccer people but he didn't he came in he kept pretty much everything in charge because he knew that they understood the program he just laid down his expectations and as you can see liverpool has changed they are actually winning now they've become that dominant liverpool that one there once was in this regard the critical role of the human resources manager cannot be overstated the human resource manager who is responsible for managing and overseeing the personal development Department of a sports organization is also involved in such tasks as per personnel, recruiting, training, evaluation. It needs to have an appreciation for the individual, the organization, and the interaction with the external environment. Consequently, this person needs to have a sophisticated communication skills set that includes knowledge of how to integrate social people, example, coaches, players, and new employees, into a new culture. Typically, the um, Hiring manager is involved in a number of activities designed to ease the transition for the new person. Organization socialization is, uh, as we see here, we got anticipatory socialization occurs before the organization entry, encounter or accommodation, the newcomer enters the organization, adoption or role management, the newcomer adapts and settles into the job. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure.